Okay, so continuing on with entomology, um, no more pictures of dead pigs, so no worries of that. Um, so what makes entomology so complicated is, you know, it sounds really easy in theory, right? Just let's collect some bugs from the dead body and then look at them, see what the species are, how long they've been there, boom, you're done. Okay, the problem with that is that a dead body is really an ecosystem, okay? And if you can remember back to your basic, you know, high school biology, an ecosystem is when you look at a certain area at everything that's living and not living, okay? So the rate of insect development can be really affected by non-living things like humidity and temperature and uh, you know, is the body in direct sunlight. It can also be affected by the different types of plants and bacteria and fungi. So it's really a, a complicated discipline to take all of those factors into consideration to come up with these timelines. But when entomologists do come up with a timeline, there are two main estimates that they make. Okay, so the one that is probably, you know, the most common is called the PMI. And I talked about this a little bit in our first lecture video. And that refers to the post-mortem interval, or basically time since death. What the PMI assumes, however, though, is that the dead body was accessible to insects at the time of death. Okay, so, you know, say for example, someone's out for a jog in the middle of July and they have a heart attack and they die and no one finds them for a while. Okay, so they're outside, it's warm enough for insects to be active. Um, the insects have accessibility to them at their time, the time of their death. So the calculation that the entomologist would do in that case would be the PMI. The different or um, a different type of calculation that can be done is also um, is called time sense colonization. And this is when the body is not accessible to insects um, at the time of death. So, for example, think of, you know, in Iowa, at least a couple of times a year, we have those unfortunate cases where um, someone is out ice fishing and they fall through the ice or someone is snowmobiling and they fall through the ice of a frozen lake and they're in really cold water where insects are not going to be active and so a lot of times the body is not colonized by insects until it is found in the spring um, or later um, you know when the the body comes to the surface okay that would be an example of time sense colonization Another example would be when you're watching the forensic and uh, anthropology case study um, about a victim that's kept in a freezer, okay? If that victim is in the freezer, insects are not gonna be active at those temperatures. But say, for example, you know, the, the person who murdered her panics and says, okay, I gotta get rid of this body. They take her out of the freezer and they go dump her somewhere um, where it's much warmer and there are insects then the insects are gonna to start to colonize her, but the, it, it would not be the same as colonizing her at the exact time of death. So that would be another example of a calculation of time since colonization. Okay, unfortunately, entomologists have also been involved in cases involving uh, abuse and neglect. So let me give you a couple of examples of these. Um, Many single car accidents that appear to have no cause um, can be traced to some type of stinging insect in the car. I mean, personally, I'm terrified of stinging insects, so I'd like to tell you that I would be totally calm if there was a wasp in my car while I was driving. Um, that would be a lie because I'm sure I would freak out and probably have a rollover accident. Um, but, you know, if a, a, there's a, a single car accident and the toxicology is negative, there was no bad weather, there's not some mechanical failure, 
you know, you can bet that that investigator is going to look through that vehicle very carefully, looking for any potential, you know, dead, stinging insect. And the pathologist is also going to look at that body very closely to see if there's any potential um, stings. Not anaphylaxis, okay, that would be very apparent at autopsy, but could it be just, you know, someone lost control of their car because they freaked out because there was a wasp in the car? Yep, that can happen. Um, you may have heard of cases of, you know, people suing nursing homes or long-term care facilities uh, because the care is not adequate. So entomology has been used when unfortunately, you know, elderly or disabled people are laying in their beds and they're not cared properly and they develop bed sores and often those bed sores can um, develop maggots in them. So, you know, that could be a civil or a criminal case, depending on, you know, what, what is determined. Um, if that, um, you know, was intentional or, you know, was it just we were not properly staffed, et cetera. Um, there was also a case I read about in the Journal of Forensic Sciences. And this is just amazing to me because I, my mind just doesn't go this dark. I mean, I don't understand the concept of having children and then abusing them. Like, I don't understand having pets and then abusing your pets. I don't get it. But this was a case of parents who actually filled a large glass jar with stinging insects like wasps and bees. And they had um, a young son who was a handful. I believe he was on the autism spectrum. And so he would have rages and tantrums. And to punish him, they would make him stick his arm inside this glass jar where these insects would just sting the heck out of him. Um, and that was his punishment. And that way, if they had to take him to the ER, the, the story could be, well, you know, Johnny just stuck his hand in a wasp nest again. Okay, well, first of all, kids are pretty smart. If they stick their hand in a wasp nest and they get stung and it hurts, usually they're not, they learn from that. They're not going to do that again. So the thought of a child doing that over and over and over just doesn't make sense. Um, luckily, the, the people in the emergency room, uh, you know, researched this further and the parents actually ended up being charged with abuse and the child was removed um, from their custody. Thank God. But I mean, that's uh, that, it's so dark. I can't even imagine something like that happening. Um, one other interesting case that I read about was um, a, a guy who traveled out th uh, past several states out west to kill his wife, um, you know, drove on backcountry roads, brought his own gas, somehow figure out how to, you know, move back the odometer so you couldn't see the miles, um, you know, pretty close to being the perfect crime. What he didn't think of, however, was to wash the vehicle before he took it back to the rental car agency. And luckily, law enforcement was able to impound that vehicle um, before the rental car company ran it through the car wash. And so they actually had an entomologist look at all the layers of insects that were on the bumper. You know, you know this when you, you know, especially during the summer, you go to the car wash and you have to scrub like heck. Um, on your windshield to get all of those bugs off and the bugs that kind of get, you know, stuck on your, the grill of your car. Um, well, that produced a perfect um, kind of pathway of how he had driven through various states. And they were able to show that, you know, if you were in Missouri, like you said you were the whole time, you wouldn't have these particular species on your vehicle because these species are only found in, you know, say it was, you know, Arizona or Southern California. So that, that, was a, that was almost the perfect crime and the entomologist, you know, helped ensure that this person didn't get away with murder. That was a pretty cool case. So insects can also affect blood spatter interpretation. So remember before we talked about, um, you know, there's low, medium, and high um, velocity impact spatter. Well, when you have a pool of blood and you have flies landing in it, whether it fleas, roaches, whatever, you know, they can pick up blood on their feet and then fly somewhere else and land. And so you actually, from insect activity and just the insects moving around, it can actually 
um, mimic high velocity blood spatter. And so an investigator comes in and they see this and they're like, well, this, you know, I want, the, you know, the, a firearm must have been involved because I'm seeing high velocity spatter. And it was actually just the artifacts produced from insects being at the scene. Okay, so an entomologist can help you, you know, with that too, determining what's an artifact and what actually is actual blood spatter. <coughs> So here's some information that potentially an entomologist could provide at the crime scene. Um, so remember, you're probably not gonna hit all of these, but if you can hit a couple of them, awesome. So doing some type of calculation, whether it is post-mortem interval or time since colonization, by looking at the different species, they potentially could determine if the body had been moved after the person was dead. Was it put in another totally different ecosystem? Which, you know, surprisingly, you don't have to move very far geographically to be in a place where there are different species of insects. Um, they can determine if the body was frozen or wrapped. Um, if you have blood producing wounds, there could be, um, they could help determine circumstances of abuse and or rape. Um, if there's blood present, remember the insects will be attracted to that because it is a liquid environment. Um, also, um, this is kind of a, you know, you are what you eat. So if you find pupa casings, you know, even if the person is fully skeletonized, um, if you find pupa casings or, or you do find insects at the scene, they've been ingesting that person. So potentially you could take that insect, um, extract DNA from them and be able to pick up the DNA of the human upon which those insects were feeding. The other thing that's really interesting is even if the actual insects are long gone, it's possible to take those pupa casings, which um, were the dark brown structures before that I previously told you looked like um, rodent droppings, and grind those up in liquid nitrogen and be able to isolate metabolites of drugs of abuse. Um, uh, metabolites for drugs are actually much smaller and much more long lasting than DNA. And so it's possible to, to look at pupa casings and be able to pick up Okay, was, you know, was the person, did they ingest a lethal amount of cocaine or heroin um, simply by looking at um, the pupa casings left over from the bugs that colonize that particular body? Also, as I mentioned, you know, looking at artifacts left by bugs, such as those mimicking blood spatter. And then this is, once again, looking at contraband and simply looking at the microscopic, you know, mites and other types of arthropods found on that evidence. And that can help potentially uh, narrow down the geographical location of where that, you know, whether it's drug evidence or what is it, you know, whatever the object is, where is the country of origin and perhaps the region within that country simply by looking at the different species that are on that type of evidence. Okay, I'm gonna stop there and get this uploading. We'll pick up with history in lecture number three. Thank you.